and we're live. We are indeed live. Saints fans, welcome back to another edition of Saints TV Live. I hope you are all well. Max, how are you today? Yeah, doing really good. I'm excited for the special guest we're going to bring on soon. And um, yeah, unfortunately, didn't get the chocolates on Saturday night, but nonetheless, couldn't be happier for, uh, for the week coming up. Yeah, nice. Um, you know, as always, Saints TV Weekly, Jake's posted a video, I believe, yesterday. And make sure to check out that as well as the Saints TV Weekly podcast uh, was uploaded a bit earlier than the, the regularly scheduled time. Uh, the new Saints TV website is also out. Make sure to check out saints, saintstv.com.au, I believe, is the the URL for that one, Max. Yep, I think you'd be right on that one, Jordan. <laughs> Sorry, I might have just caught you off guard a little bit there. Um, little... And I believe there's an open training session tomorrow, 10.30 a.m. Yep, uh, so everyone get down to RSCA Park. There will be training from about 10.30 to 12.30 um, from what I know is that there will also be a sausage sizzle run by some of the ex, ex-Saints players. Um, so, yeah, everyone try and get down. Jordan and I will be there, and I believe the godfather himself will be there as well. Yep, so make sure to come up and say hi and give Max a big kiss. Um, Sainers, we've got, a, we've got a bit of a special guest, I'm sure, as you know, tonight. He's played 291 games of AFL football across three clubs. Um, 180, I believe, for the Saints in particular, was St Kilda's leading goal scorer in 2000. Is a three-time All Australian, a two-time Best and Fairest winner, one with the Saints and one with the Hawks, and has recently been inducted into St Kilda's Hall of Fame. So I'd like to welcome to the show tonight, Peter Everett Spider. How you doing, mate? Yeah, good. Good evening. How are we both? Good. Yeah, not bad. Yeah. Not bad. Beautiful. I think we'll uh, we'll get stuck into this spider just straight off the bat. What have you been up to um, post footy life? Oh, look, yeah, no, I've been busy. I'm on the Gold Coast, so just to rub it into those people who are in the southern states, uh, it's going to be 26 on Melbourne. Uh, I mean, in uh, 26 on Monday. It's going to be beautiful over the weekend, but uh, yeah, look, it's a, a good part of the world. But um, yeah, I've been I do brekkie radio, so I'm up at 3.30 every morning and then uh, do triple M brekkie radio on the Gold Coast. Uh, that's, I've been doing that for about 10, 12 years now and also do a lot of travel. So I travel a lot around Australia, showing people what they can see for those people who uh, haven't been fortunate enough to get out there and uh, see a lot of the country. It's magnificent, uh, certain parts of it. So we do motorhome tours, we travel around Australia and try and show it off to the best of our ability. So that's pretty much since uh, I've retired. That's all I've been doing. What's uh what's the biggest hidden gem in Australia you reckon that you've been able to see? Oh, uh, I reckon it, it depends what you love. Like I, I you know, Lady Elliot Island just off Bundaberg there is unbelievable. If you love snorkeling, you love your marine life, it's magnificent. It's one of the best places you'll see. But then if you love the red dust, you go to the Birdsville races or the big red and uh you know meet all the country folk throughout Australia. And then only last weekend I was in Perth, I was up at Carnarvon. And, you know, in a 10-minute helicopter flight, you know, you're seeing whales and dugongs and manta rays and turtles and dolphins. And so, look, I think you know, Australia's just got so much to offer. And if you don't don't head out there and head, head amongst you, get out into the middle of Australia, you don't really see the real of Australia. So, yeah, there's so many great places. It just depends what you love. Yeah, nice. Spider, you mentioned you've been you've been up to a radio show. What's Have you got any funny stories from, from your time as a, a radio host? Oh, look, I think, um, you know, radio, it's, it's like, like now. Uh, you've got to really think on the, on the, on the fly. Uh, and um, sometimes because you're so casual and we start at 5 o'clock in the morning because we're right on the tweed. So, you know, during COVID, uh, it was really interesting because we had the New South Wales rules and also we had the Queensland rules. So, you know, you've got one plastic barrier separating two states and we, we you know, obviously broadcast into both of them. So on one side, we're allowed to go to the pub and drink beer and do what we want. And on the other side, they're locked in their houses, not allowed to do a thing. And you're like 10 metres away. So look, radios, I, I find it funny. It's, it's hard because you're with a group of mates talking. So the hardest thing is uh, trying not to swear when you're <laughs> just mucking around with a group of mates. So 
Yeah, though, there's uh, yeah, radio is about having fun. So, you know, trying to be upbeat and fun at 5 a.m. in the morning, some people find it hard, but you know, we're always mucking around and uh, enjoying each other's company to have that interaction of trying to make everyone's day a little bit early, uh, easier when they wake up in the morning. No, I love it, Spider. Um, just getting you now, sort of switching gears a little bit to uh, the current Saints side. Have you been, I guess, uh, following the Saints since you've uh, since you retired? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, look, I, I'm, I'm a Saints fan and, uh, you yeah, know, I always, always will be, follow them the whole way. And I still, when I drive to work uh, in the morning and on a Monday morning, there's a guy and I haven't dropped into his house yet, but he's on the Esplanade of the Gold Coast and he has the Saints flag flying every time they win and every time they lose, he hides it. So um, I actually want to go and knock on his door one day. But, yeah, look, yeah, I, I follow the Saints, my young fella, uh, he absolutely loves them as well, Boston. So, you know, we've been following passionately for years and years and uh, follow the current side and try and get to as many games as we can. And because he's living in Melbourne now, it makes it a little bit easier. But, um, yeah, for years I haven't really been able to get there because I've always been on the Gold Coast. Yeah, nice, Spider. Well, obviously, you're still following the Saints. So um, which current Saint has, has caught your eye? Which one's been the most exciting to watch? Oh, you got to stick with the Ruckman. You know, the big men today. You know, they, they bag us out through the media, yet we're so vital to every team. Every team wants a really good big man. And, uh, you know, we can go back to the days of Laser Vitovic to, you know, now uh, Raul Marshall, which uh, I think is his is jet. He's been so good this year. Really, it's going to be a really good competition to see who makes the All-Australian. Him and Tommy English are probably, you know, the top two at the moment from the Bulldogs who's going to make All-Australian. So him and, uh, yeah, for me, just because... He's got a truckload of tats and he, he can play was memory. I love Timmy. So they're, they're probably our, my two go players. For my young fella, he loves he loves uh, steel. So you kind of sit there and go, yeah, there's so many good players to love, but you know, I've got to stick with the Ruckman and a forward kicks goals. <laughs> yeah, love it. I think that was the same as uh, Cozzy when we interviewed him a few weeks ago. He, he's um, absolutely frothing Rowan Marshall at the moment. Well, Cozzy's going to try and claim him. Cozzy does a little bit of ruck work down there for about 10 minutes a week. Uh, and you now he's going to sit there and go, I'm the greatest ruck coach of all time. I've, I've taught Ryan Marshall everything. And Cozzy would go in the ruck for about, what, about three minutes a game every now and then. So, yeah, if you can claim him, I would be too. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Um, I've always wanted to ask a, an AFL ruckman this. Um, when you get rest or quote-unquote rested up for, does it always – sort of feel like you're actually getting a rest or do you still have to work your ass off to, um, to I don't know, compete in the Ford 50? Yeah, forwards only do half the half the work of a good Ruckman. Uh, no, you know, you know, honestly, when you look at it, you know, Ruckman these days, they, you know, if you played, you know, there was a year there probably in the late 90s where I played every game and every minute. And that's unheard of these days to stay on the ground for every game of the year for the whole 22, 24 rounds and play every minute of the game. So you go from right to forward, but I love it. I, I much prefer that. And you see that working with, uh, you know, other ruckmen and other other clubs is that, you know, the ruck's a certain role, but you're, you're covering 10, 12 kilometres a game through, through a ruck contest, you know, through getting to ruck contests, forward and back. And going forward, it is a bit of a rest, but if you're going all right, you still want to be able to have that tall presence up forward. And then, you know, your ruckman can actually play outside the 50. You can take all the in forward 50 stoppages and then be an advantage to the team. So I still believe that there's probably out of, you know, the, all the teams in the competition, easily half of those could play ruck forward and they should just to, you know, just mix up the, the forward line structures a little bit. So that's what I, that's what I believe. And that's what I was able to do. So yeah, I loved it. I, yeah. And plus the easiest way to get your name in the paper on the weekend, which you all love as much as people say, Oh yeah, don't read the paper is if you kick a goal, you got your name in the paper, so you're happy. Yeah, uh, I think everyone loves kicking, kicking a goal and taking a big clunk mark. Absolutely. In, uh, 50. Um, how do you think the game has now changed since when you've played to, to the sort of the modern-day Ruckman or just everywhere else on the grounds? Yeah, look, I, I still enjoy footy. I know a lot of people say, oh, they don't watch it. And, you know, you're looking at, uh, you know, the tackling techniques and you look how footy has has evolved over the years. But, look, I think it's all for the good of the game. Um, you know, it's got a little bit quicker. But, you know, the superstars of the 80s and 90s would be superstars today because they would have grown up and developed with what is in 
in place today. So, yeah, look, I think probably the main the main differences outside of um, you know when you look at you know the anal- you know, just watching so much vision about the opposition and and you know your pre- previews and your reviews and yeah you know, behind the scenes stuff is simple fact that you know after a game we would just hightail it straight to Stewie Lowe's pub and would sit there for six or seven hours and uh, have a good night straight after a game. Where these days they get recovery, they go and have their uh, dinner, go to bed, wake up, do recovery and start their reviews. So, look, in our, our days, there was a, a big difference in the way that, uh, you know, footy off the field was played, but on the field, you know, still, you, you, you train and prepare exactly what they do today. Yeah, Spider, you mentioned, you know, obviously players, you know, they got a bit more focus on their recovery um, nowadays. Would you have preferred to, to still play Black back then, or maybe you know, have the opportunity to to heal your body a little bit after the game, play in modern era. Yeah, look, I still believe the nineties was the best era for, for football, and people who love footy, the nineties was fantastic. It was a, a great time in football. Um, you know, you're able to go out, really enjoy yourself. You, you still got, you know, you, you trained hard, you played hard, and you're with a group of mates, and you're really close on and off the field. So I absolutely love the nineties, but then. You watch today and you see Rowan Marshall and Tommy English and, you know, they, they, they pump up Gorn and, um, you know, Grundy and all these blokes. And you sit there and go, well, I'd love, you know, you, you'd still love to have a crack at them and see how you'd go against these these guys. Because, you know, when we first started with guys like, you know, Corey McKernan and, uh, you know, guys like that, we started the running game of football because Ruckman used to just go and sit back in the hole in front of the full forwards and then we started running and then kicking goals and changed the way, you know, footy was played in the in the mid-90s with, with the ruck roll. So, yeah, tough question, but you'd always love to challenge yourself against, uh, you know, those guys running around today. Yeah, nice. Well, this question might be a little less tough for you to answer. Oh, well, you know, depending on, on what you think of it, I guess. Um, what's your best or, or funniest memory as a sainter? Oh, Gee, you write a book on them. Uh, yeah, I love it. You know, I, yeah, from walking in the front, you know, the first day you walk into the front door and, you know, somebody like Tony Lockett comes up and says, G'day, I'm Tony Lockett. And it's like, yeah, hello. Yeah, I know. That. Um, you don't have to tell me. Uh, to, you know, you know what I really used to love? And, um, you know, this is what I loved about, you know, the St Kilda Football Club was Jack Barker, um, the dad of Trevor Barker. Every Thursday night, we used to have a raffle. And, there used to be two dollars a ticket, and you'd win anything from a, a, a box of uh, chocolate biscuits to yeah a, a tea towel or, or something else. But all the players would put all their money in. Jack would draw the numbers out, and everyone would be yelling and screaming and jumping around the change rooms on a uh, on a Thursday night. Two dollars a ticket, and you'd win a box of uh, chocolate biscuits, and everybody would rip them open and hoe into them. But yeah, that's that. That's what I loved about the footy club. Just the the enthusiasm around a, a Thursday night raffle that was ran, ran by one of the the great legends of the club, uh, Trevor Barker, and his old man Jack Barker. I just you know things like that. Um, you can you, you just don't get at every football club, and and things like that. I, I really just cherish the the moments and the the days that we're able to play there and be a part of things like that. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, we've had a few stories from from some of the guests that we've interviewed and they all sort of say the same thing. It's just about being with their group of mates on in and around training and it's not even the uh, the adventures that they get to go on. It's just, you know, I don't know the casual Thursday nights, as you said, uh, are probably the most memorable, aren't they? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, you know, you know, the old days when they had the sauna in the, uh, the, the back uh, change rooms and it was called the sledge box. So you'd go in there and just absolutely sledge everyone in the opposition. And it was fantastic. Yeah, we, we loved it. And, uh, we'll, you know, there's a, a, a sauna that could normally only fit about 10 people, 25 of us in there. It was just, yeah, they're, they're the memories that, uh, yeah, you never forget when, you know, the change rooms were about to fall apart. But, you know what, we love training there. Yeah, exactly right. I'm sure uh, Moravin back in the 90s would have been an absolute blast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's not even getting onto the social club later on on the Saturday night after the games. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Um, we might, you know, just switch gears a little bit just to uh, start talking about 
this upcoming Friday, Saints versus Brisbane, um, obviously going to be Spud's game. Will you be able to make it down to Melbourne for, for Spud's game? Nah, unfortunately, um, not this weekend. Uh, I was down last weekend and, uh, yeah, I'll, I'd love to be there. Um, I've got work commitments with, uh, I know this is going to sound silly compared to, you know, Spud's game, but I've got to hand a chocolate cake into the Mudra Bar show as a cooking competition that I've entered through work. So I'm hoping to win that. But now I've got to host uh, the races up here as well. So for their, uh, for their day. But, you know, it, it is a really, really important day. And uh, I find, you know, football clubs have these days and I think they do a magnificent job being able to promote and also, you know, give tribute to those people, uh, you know, like Spud and, you know, really get the message out there that mental health is a, is a really big issue right now. And if anybody needs help, go and get assistance. And, and uh, for those people who don't need assistance, by, by all means, just uh, ask your mates and your friends if you're okay because uh, it's, it's a great stance that St Kilda Footy Club's able to do and on the back of, unfortunately, a, a huge tragedy for the football club. Yep, too right, Spider. Um, it's a great initiative what the Saints are doing. Um, I think... Particularly, uh, you know, men like like Danny Frawley, you know, men struggle to to speak out. Uh, you know, all of us have our have our issues, some bigger than others, and um, we've all gone through rough times. I know that I've been fortunate enough to have Max as a mate to to speak to when I've been going through some stuff, and you know, I'm sure you'll you'll find confidence in me sometime. You know, if he's going through some stuff, but yeah, to all all the viewers, you know, make sure to. To, you know, if, if something's not right in your life, make sure to uh, talk to someone you trust. Um, yeah, just a great yeah. initiative by the St Kilda Football Club. Um, on on Danny Frawley, Spider, what was your favourite member? Do you have a, a best memory of him? Oh. Yeah, look, I, I think Spud was just a – it was he was the best leader that uh, – I played under, and this was before we had leadership groups and, you know, everybody's a leader. And, you know, Spud was an absolute leader. He was our captain. He was our mentor. He was the guy we looked up to. He was the guy that made the decisions. He was the yay or nay person. He was the one that said, okay, it's time to be serious. Let's get down to work. Let's train. Let's do this. And then let's go and have fun. So he really knew the balance between, you know, being serious on the field and, and training and then able to trans transition that into having fi- uh, fun off the field because, you know, we'll go to footy trips and, uh, you know, they'll be six or seven days long and Spud would go hard out and then he'd go missing after the fourth day because he'd just go hard for four days and then leave us and go home. Um, but there's there's so many great memories, uh, you know, that, that uh, yeah, Spud leaves behind. And, uh, you know, the biggest one now, I think, is being able to really, you know, push that message of mental health because, uh, you know, players today... And also, you know, individuals today really do do struggle. But, um, yeah, for me, it was just Spud as a captain. He was always the, 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 the life of the party. I remember going to Bungaree for his, for his 30th um, up there in a pub that's about, uh, you know, fits about 20 people and there would have been 60 of us in there. All, uh, all parked our cars in the outside and for some reason I woke up with the heater on in my car uh, around about four o'clock in the morning. So it was, uh, yeah, we, we love Spud and, uh, you know, there's, there's great memories and you can go on for hours. Yeah. Um, just going on that, because he sort of retired as you were joining the club, there might have been a th- two, three-year crossover, according to Jordan and I's research. Did he sort of take you under the ring, uh, under his wing, or was there another player that took you or took um, you under their wing? Yeah, no, look, I think, um, you know, for for that time, Stuart Lowe as well. I worked with Lowe for a lot. So probably Lowe had probably the most influence uh, on my early days. Um, these are the days where you'd still work a few hours and then, um, you know, go and actually play footy. So probably Lowe in the early days because of, uh, you know, working with him, eating and, uh, you know, watching how he does everything. So probably more so Lowe, but, um, you know, I think, you know, those, those footy days were a lot different. You know, I mean, we were a lot closer as a team, so everybody had a little bit of influence. You always looked up to, you know, players like Harves and that, how they trained and then Spud, how he trained. So I think, you know, you, you know I remember coming in after training and they'd have a, a sit-up competition and do 100, 200 sit-ups with a medicine ball all yelling and screaming, having competitions against each other. So it kind of all blended in together, but working with Lowy probably gave me a better insight into preparing for AFL than anybody else. 
yeah, nice. Good that you had that that relationship, um, you know, early in your career. Um, circling back to mental health, Spider, what's something that you'd like supporters to know about footballers to ensure that their their mental health remains in you know an ideal state? You know, we saw a a couple of weeks ago fans saying some you know unfavorable things towards towards Carlton players in particular, abusing Jack Silvani. Um, you know, that's not something we want in the game. So I guess you know. Does that does that play a part of it? The the fans expressing their emotions, or what what other insights can you give into you know yeah. footballers' mental health? Yeah, it does. It's and it's tough because you know as fans, as supporters, even as players, you know we're really passionate and and we love our club and we want them to succeed and you know we we put up the phase. We don't like the opposition and you know we can bag them out and we can ooh and ah and cheer and boo as much as we want. But I think when you start getting a little bit more personal and you know, social media is such a big issue these days as well. And, you know, you got to think of these players. Think that, you know, if you're having a crack at somebody or a player, you're not the only one doing that. So you you might be the, the 40th person that day. You might have been the 80th person that day. You're not the only person in Australia that, that feels that way. But does that player really need to hear that? Um, you know, if he's walking down the street and you come off a bad loss and suddenly you say, oh, Jesus Christ, why would you miss that goal? And then do you think you're the only person that's actually reminded that mm. he's missed that goal? It's, so you've got to think and, and, and put yourself in their shoes. They get, they, they, they get that from the coaches, from the players, from the staff, then from the members, from fans, from opposition. So it's a lot of you know, scrutiny around players these days compared to what it was years and years ago and, and social media don't, don't help that at all either so for me it would be you know what why do you have to be negative let's be positive if you haven't got anything positive to say why bother saying it because you're only going to jump on the bandwagon of hundreds and hundreds of others so if we can slowly cut that down that means players aren't going to be in that space of you know because I, I want to see them interact on social media I reckon they they do a great job it's nice to see them on the footy show but you don't really see them when you see them on their social media, that's more them. Why? And I, I think it's great to see them in their, you know, I don't want to treat them as animals, but their natural in habitat, you know, what they normally do. Uh, that's what we want to see. So, yeah, I, I think my main thing is, look, don't be negative towards them. If you've got something great to say, by all means, but don't worry, they're getting enough negative feedback and they judge themselves harsh enough. They don't need to be told. Yeah, I think that's an awesome message, Spider. It just sort of puts everything back into perspective that, yes, these these guys are still um, professional athletes, but half of them are only in their 20s. And I know Jordan and I, there's a few of our um, kids in, at the Saints right now that are pretty similar age to us that are getting scrutinised almost weekly, it feels like. And yeah. you know, I couldn't open myself up to that at this age. Well, you you, know, you try and put yourself in there and, and you might be just, say, you, 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 know, you could be stacking shelves at the supermarket and then if you know, the boss is having a cracky and then the checkout people are having a cracky and everyone walking past go, mate, how come that's not level? Or how come that's – like you'll get to after a day when, you know, 50, 60 people are walking past just having a cracky. So, you know, I think you've just got to be a bit easier on them and uh, you just uh, be a bit more lenient and just think – be positive. You know, if you – who cares what Carlton do? Who cares what any – just just worry about the Saints. Pump them up. <laughs> exactly right. Um, we're going to segue now, Spider, into a bit of trivia about your career. Do you? Uh, does that sound good with you? Okay, I'm happy to. Yeah, give it a go. <laughs> happy to give it a crack. Um, we've sort of kept these relatively easy, and then we'll as we go through, they'll get harder and harder. Oh, radio. <laughs> First of all, what years did you win your two BNFs? Oh, well, it was hard because Robert Harvey won them every other year. <laughs> um, so my BNS one was at Hawthorne in 04. Yep, correct. And I must admit, uh, I reckon the Saints it would have been 2000 or 2001. I'll take 201, no, 2000. No, 201 because you nodded your head. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give it to you. Um, what's your most goals kicked in a game? I kicked nine seven one day and Blighty told me I was absolutely terrible down at Cadinia Park on Benny Graham. And then Benny Graham went off to play uh, in the, um, what is it, the Super Bowl. So I cost him his career, I tell him, but nine seven. <laughs> yep, exactly right. And it was that down at Cadinia Park in 2000. Um, and then what's your most hit outs in a game? Ooh. 
Gee, I was only looking, not, I wasn't looking at mine. I was looking at a few of the other players the other day, but I'd have to say, I don't think it's in the 50s. I'd, I'd say it'd be 42. Oh. One off. 43. Oh, I, was, I wasn't trying to brag, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I believe you. Uh, I believe you cracked forty cup a few times, but yeah, most was forty three when you're actually playing for the Hawks um, in two thousand and three, I believe it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was a uh, yeah. I, I feel the rucks is just a great position. It's the best position on the ground. Well, I can be biased. Yeah. Well, we're three questions in, uh, Spider, and you've already got more than, than Bakes did, I think. You know, Stephen Baker only got oh, like two geez. or something. And if I didn't do that, I would have just hung up on you. <laughs> you can't beat Bakes, you just give up. <laughs> I, I really hope Bakes is watching this. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, he'll send a text. He'll send a text. Spider, this one might be a bit, a bit trickier for you. Um, what's your most kicks in a game? Oh. I don't reckon I got many I, – I, 30 touches I wouldn't have gone over, but I didn't handball a great deal. So it would still be in the mid-20s. So I would have to say around about 24. Uh, it was actually 20, that one. Oh, was it? Yeah, round – according to AFL tables, round 19, 1998 against the Hawks, ironically. Oh, they must have ripped me off four kicks. <laughs> might have to, I might have to write to AFL tables. Yeah, to get go, and check the, go and check the fine print. Uh, um, what about most bounces in a game? Oh, actually, I, I did. Actually, as a big man, I did. I had one bounce uh, and it just darted off and <laughs> I, I had to go and recover it. But I would think most bounces in a game, I'd go, oh, it wouldn't be a lot. If I'm bragging, if I say four, I'm going to go four. Spider, I think you're underestimating yourself a bit, and we might have to do a bit of research into this one to see if it's actually true, but it is apparently six. Um, no, round, right. round eight, 1998 against, against the Bombers. Oh, was it? Yeah. Down the wing. I would have been yes, playing yeah. on uh, big um, uh, Alessio, Steve Alessio. So I was I'll probably a bit quicker than Steve. Take your word for it. We weren't exactly around then to, to verify that. <laughs> yeah, um, you guys will have to go back to Google. Um, but this is the last one. So hopefully, um, you know, what are you, what are you now? I think it's still three for five. So let's try and go yeah. four for six, um, which is pretty good, by the way. Where do you rank for St Kilda all time in goals kicked? Oh, oh in goals kicked. Um well, you know, when you plugger, and then you get lowy, and then you get that. I would have to go, really. Or oh, I reckon eleven. Oh, pretty close. In tenth, at exactly. Oh, I was going to say I'd be lucky to be in the top ten. You got to give me that. That's not bad. I'll give you that one. Just snuck in there. That's one behind Kevin Neal and eight behind Barry Breen. Oh, gee, I should have kicked those ones. A couple of them hit the post. <laughs> it's a bit stiff. Oh, we might have to check how much, how, how many coats of paint were on were on the yeah, goalpost. Yeah, yeah. Maybe check give you a out. couple more. <laughs> uh, awesome yeah. stuff. Um, we're gonna we're gonna move into some fan questions now. Um, yeah. So, same as comment comment some of the stuff that you'd like to ask Spider. Um, we'll kick this kicked off with Guy. He wants to know if you were as scared as Big Bad Bazza as we all were. Absolutely. I got fined one day for uh, Barry Hall was finding Matthew Scarlett on the 50 metre line. And like that's when they started bringing fines with the third man in. And I ran 40 metres to help Hawley. I have no idea why, because he had didn't need no help. And I got fined four and a half thousand dollars for jumping in to ha- help Hawley. So yeah, everyone was scared of Hawley. If we had to do like a boxing training session, you know, he picked you know, the last person to be picked. It was Hawley because you're too scared to go one on one with him. Yeah, nice. Um, Spider, these aren't questions; they're more so comments, but they're more about talking, talking about what you mentioned before about you'd like to go up against Max Gorn. Um, Beth's mentioned that she reckons you were as easily as skilled as Gorney, and Guy reckons that you could, uh, that Gorn couldn't hold a candle to you. 
Yeah, look, <laughs> look it's it's interesting because you look at them and you know it frustrates you because Gorney would just grab the the ball out of the ruck in the forward fifty and have a crack. But you know, I think um, you know most players, and it's no different to halves. He would sit there and, and want to line himself up against uh, you know some of the yeah your Bontepellis and all that these days. So and Bakes, who you had on, like imagine him on Nick Nate Dacos. It would be fantastic to watch. You know, he wouldn't be able to handle the pinching and the the scratching and the biting of Bakes. So. Yeah, look, I think it'd be really good to be able to battle that. You'll never be able to, but, um, you know, you can always sit there and, and believe and dream. <laughs> Maybe in – does AFL Max, do you know if AFL 23, the, the video game, has past players in it? Maybe you could, you know, Spider, you could play in the, the virtual well, world against Max Gorn. As soon as my name goes in there, that's the first lineup I'm going to do, and I'll stream it live and see what happens. So, yeah, absolutely. So we're looking forward to that coming out with the uh, – the past players, there's a few uh, guns there. It's going to be fantastic. That would be great as well. Uh, awesome. Uh, so now let's maybe speaking about the future of the potentially Saints footy, Graham wants to know how your son's developing at footy. Could we potentially see a father-son in the future? Yeah, look, he's loving it. He's really enjoying it. And that was the idea between... Um, about going to Melbourne. He goes to Kerry Grammar at the moment. Uh, we know there's a, you know, they've got a, a great football system coached by Johnny Barker, um, who former Hawthorne player and, and Carlton coach. So, you know, he's uh, in year 11 this year, year 12 next year. He does the Saints Academy on Wednesdays and absolutely loves it. So, no, he's doing all the, all the right things and um, he really hopes to to play at the Saints. That's his goal. That's his dream. And let's hope he, let's hope he does because I think personally, I, I, I love the father and son rule. I think it's fantastic that you see the Dacos boys at Collingwood, you see Sylvania at, at Carlton, Moore at Collingwood, and uh, you know all these players, uh, ex-players and their sons or daughters coming through the system. So, yep, my young fella's down there with that, uh, that in mind, and he really loves the support and what he's been offered at uh, St Kilda so far, just learning the ropes before uh, you know, his big year next year. Yeah, nice. Yeah. There was a oh, question sorry. earlier. Oh, sorry, Max. Yeah, there's a question, um, I think, on the, the post that uh, Saints TV put up uh, earlier today advertising about uh, your upcoming, and um, one of the comments was asking if we could ask you about when Boston's available for father-son selection. So, Terry, if you're watching, I hope that answers your question. I think it's – is he year 11 this year? Is that right? Yeah, he's year 11, so year 12 next year, which he won't even be 18. He'll be only still 17 at the draft because uh, he was born in December, so – if he, uh, he's lucky enough to get drafted and picked up, we've still got to drive him to training for a couple more weeks, which will be, <laughs> <laughs> which will be great. But, uh, yeah, so, yeah, he's still got 16 months or 18 months until next year's draft. Yeah. Terry, if you're watching, put that on your calendar, mate. Um, yeah. Spider, Beth's wondering um, about your nickname. Was it due to your long legs or is there another a story? And I hope the story, if there is one, is PJ rated. Yeah, no, it is because, well, my first nickname was Stalker. So I'm happy it's not that anymore. Um, <laughs> trust me. But that was because I had uh, bony elbows and knees like a like a stalk. But, yeah, no, the spider come from, yeah, long and dangling. Then I had dreadlocks, which looked like spider legs. And, and now, actually, no one knows. My, a lot of people don't even know my real name. They just think it is actually spider. And I say... Yes, it is. So, yeah, I just everything now just runs under spider. So my whole life is spider, spider, spider. All my emails spider. So it makes it a little bit easier. So yeah, it's it's good. It's stuck, and uh, yeah, I don't think it's going anywhere. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Jared wants to know: Will we ever see the spider dance again? Oh, this is one of the greats. Tony Woods wrote that. It was on the Footy Show. I can even <laughs> sing. Put your hands in the air, shake them everywhere, do the spider dance. I'm a saint. No, you ain't. Just you eat spider bait. He's my man. Yes, he can. Spider dance, spider jam. Even still remember it. So, yeah, I don't think you... I, I might... Yeah, I should pull it out one year. Give it a reunion. A 20-year or 30-year reunion. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, Spider, Rhiannon's asking uh, not more of a personal question, but more a general one, if you think the Saints will win on Friday night. Me, personally, absolutely. I... I think it's a really important game for, for both teams. Brisbane, were, yeah, they got over the line, but um, they're just going at the moment. A few of their guns aren't really performing that well, and we know they're no good when they travel. So the Saints at home, really good golden opportunity, a big game for what it represents. But, 
more importantly, if they win, I totally believe if the Saints win this, this really can set them up for finals. Then they have the belief that they can play finals. They should be there. Brisbane were always destined to finish in the top four. Beat them at home can set them up for a, for a good finals campaign. So for me, I, I find this game a really important one, not only for the Danny Frawley game, but but for the Saints going forward towards uh, 2023 final series. So absolutely, I reckon they can win by a couple of goals. Yeah, if I tend to agree, I think it'll, it, it just gets the momentum going. You always want to find your form in the second half of the season. And yeah, as you said, if we can beat a top four or top five side, then... Yeah, who knows what finals well, holds. Yeah, and they've got to be disappointed on the weekend against uh, Richmond. You know, we're watching that game and, you know, to have them on toast and then allow them to come back in and, you know, they'll be sitting there going, you know, why didn't we do this and why didn't we do that? And we knew as soon as the rain come, you know, it was going to make it even tougher and then they got themselves nearly tilt, but they couldn't get over the line. But they should never have been in that op- in that uh, position after 20 minutes of the first quarter. So I think a uh, really important game for them. Yep, exactly right. Um, that's the comment I was looking for. Uh, can you see a second flag under Ross Lyon? I can. I, I, I think, um, you know, the Saints have surprised a few even this year. Uh, you know, when you're tip, trying to do your eight at the start of the year, you didn't know how it was going to sit. You didn't know how Ross was going. I think the structure and the format they've got is great. They can bring – they've developed some really good young talent that's only going to get better and better over the next couple of years. And – you know, you always bring one or two players in through trading as well. So, look, I think this, the Saints have absolutely got a got a golden opportunity here to to sit there and move forward and and really believe that they can finish top four, play finals. You know, that's what, what my argument is. You know, first you've got to worry about making the eight, make the top four, make the top two, and then worry about that uh, last day in September. But um, you know. I think everybody's been impressed with just their their attitude so far and the way they've gone about their day-to-day business at the footy club in in winning games and getting themselves structured there. They've got some learning still to do, but you always do after, uh, you know, with a new coach coming in. Yeah, nice. Uh, Spider, we've got a comment from our friend, the uh, the unfiltered fisherman. Um, Not so much a, a question, but more of a... More of a comment. He, he's reminiscing about you know uh, the memories of of you, well the memories that he had of you uh, as a kid. Uh, he says, "Spider, when I've seen you visit Low, as did many other Saints players in Middle Park, I was all, I was a kid growing up in a very violent domestic violence household. The memories of just seeing you has always held strong, uh, and he's thanking you for that." Yeah, look, I think um, a lot of people see us on a Saturday. Uh, on a Friday night, a Saturday, see us game day, and you know that that is what we what we play football for. You know, we love running out onto the MCG. You know, sixty thousand people, thirty thousand love you, thirty thousand hate you. They're yelling and screaming. That's the fun of football. But it's behind the scenes and the little bits and pieces you can do to to really you know hopefully help people in their day to day lives if it's from people who are in those situations of domestic violence or, you know, sick kids in hospital, which we've always been able to help to make a wish foundations. And, you know, a lot of people don't see the, the work a lot of players do in that area. I pride myself on that. I used to really, really love it and uh, really cherish that thing, that, that moment. Because as I say, I was never enough fortunate enough to win any, you know, big grand finals or, or premierships, but I was able to, you know, have have influence on on kids in hospitals and, and people in, in situations when they're feeling down and out. So, you know, that that to me is one of the highlights of being able to play AFL football, having that responsibility and being able to give back in that way that, you know, a lot of people in the outside football world would never, ever have seen or known about. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. It's it, it's more. It's it's not. Sorry, it's bigger bigger than just football. You're, you're touching people's lives, and as the unfiltered fisherman has just sort of commented through, it's yeah, it, it sticks with people. Um, even just you know the casual high when you go and go and coffee in the morning, you run into one of your idols growing up. So yeah, that, yeah. that's awesome. it. It means a lot to you as much as it does to the fans that do meet you. And if he is a fisherman, I do a podcast about fishing that I can give a plug to, the anglers. So tell him to follow. It's a little bit of fun. We just uh, we interview people all around the world who fish, people from Amsterdam to uh, Kenya to India to Canada. It's 
quite fascinating. <laughs> and I don't even fish that much and I find it fascinating. <laughs> awesome. All right, Jordan, we'll, we might find one more question each before we wrap it up. Craig wants to know, Spider, how your golf is going or have you put the clubs away? Oh, I never put the clubs away. Uh, it's not going – actually, it got better. I don't know how. Uh, I played with uh, Tony Lockett's brother only the other day and we won the uh, the comp for the day, which I was very, very excited. My drives were going straight and he was putting them nicely. So, look, here on the Gold Coast, we've got 36 uh, – golf courses around town. So, you know, as I mentioned at the top of the show, we've got 24, 25 degrees. So, yeah, we try and get out every couple of weeks. It's not improving golf, but um, I don't play it enough to make it improve. I just enjoy going out there and having a hit and hopefully getting a couple down the middle every now and then. So it's a great way to uh, to relax, get away from everything and just enjoy it with a couple of mates. Yeah, nice. Spider... Well, one last one last question from me, yep. I suppose. Do you do you see another flag for for St Kilda? If so, uh, do you see another flag for St Kilda in the next in the next couple of years? I've sort of butchered that one. Sorry. Yeah, look, and like I said before, I think they're on the right path. Um, look, I, I was actually only talking about it today. Like, there's two teams you'd love to see win a flag, and you know, I'm not a massive Carlton fan, but you know what? To see Ligon Street absolutely go bunter. Uh, it would be fantastic. But I reckon if the St Kilda Footy Club won a flag, I reckon you go to Moorabbin the day after and you will not be able to get a seat there. I reckon it would be absolutely jam-packed. There will be thousands, tens of thousands, 100,000 people there. And I think you know, St Kilda is everyone's second favourite club. So I think there is, um, but we know just how hard it is. You know, you look at your Geelong Football Club and you, you look at your Tigers, but... What I take out of the last probably 10 years of football is if you actually get to the top and you've got the right team, you can hold it together for a long period, you know, for, for quite a few years to give yourself that, that golden opportunity. You know, you saw Brisbane win quite a few, Hawthorne, then Richmond. So, you know what, you've just got to get there, get the right balance and stick those players together and then uh, you don't know what could happen. So we can only cross our fingers, we can only hope. Uh, for my young fella, he wants it to wait a couple more years until he gets uh, picked up and in the side. But I said, look, we'll take them whenever they come. So like every Saints supporter out there, we just absolutely hope. Exactly right. Uh, hopefully it is sooner rather than later. And I, I can imagine I only live just down the road from RCA Park. And I, um, yeah, I can imagine hoping to see every everyone that's not only in the stream, but maybe even yourself down at RCA Park on Linton Street. Oh, um, you'd see everyone. I reckon it'd be absolutely jam-packed. It would be unbelievable. And we we just know how hard it's been and the times they've gone through. For them to to get to the get to the pinnacle and get to the top. And you know, there's so many jokes around about just having one flag. To have that second one would just shut everyone up. <laughs> yep, exactly right. Um, Spider, thank you so much for your time. Um, we hope you, you've had a blast as much as we've been enjoyed asking you questions and Sainers as well for, for commenting in. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your time and, and we'll let you go now. Absolutely. No worries at all. Thank you very much. Anytime. And uh, to those you know, Saints people who are online and, and watching, uh, you know, a really important game. We know how important it is this weekend. The Danny Frawley game against uh, Brisbane to show your support. And more importantly, if uh, you know somebody is struggling out there, you know, just ask them, you know, it's, it's okay now. Just ask them if they are okay. So have a great game and hopefully the Saints can get the win over the weekend. Awesome. Thanks, Spider. No worries. Cheers. See you, mate. See ya. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. I just accidentally cut him out a little bit. Oh, Max, how could you do that? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, well, sorry about that, Spider. But, yeah, you can tell as a radio host because he spoke fantastically. Um. Great, gave great answers, and and I loved having him on. How about you, Max? I'm sure you did as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I thought he gave really great answers and a lot of insight into um what the four walls were behind St Kilda, um especially in the in the nineties and the golden age of footy. Yeah, and got four out of six trivia questions as well, so it did pretty well in that aspect. Yeah, it did very well. We um, uh, we, I don't know if everyone knows this, but we we did tell Troy um to or Troy Schwartz to um. Do a little bit of research, so I think that's maybe why he did incredibly well. We didn't tell Spot to do any research in his career; he just sort of knows the numbers off the top of his head. So that's, um, yeah, really impressive to see. 
Yeah, nice. Well, don't go away, Sainers, because we are going to do a little bit of a review of the Tigers game and then jump into the Lions. Um, Max, what do you think of the game on the weekend? Yeah, look, it's been um, it's been reviewed and, and reviewed and reviewed over and over again. But I think the only thing I want to speak about was just sort of that transition from the first quarter to the second quarter. I guess when the rain came in, how we how we adapted. Um, look, I'm no football expert, Jordan. I know you're not as well. The only thing I say that we I, I dare say we could have done better is that when the ball's on the deck, instead of trying to get those clean handballs that never really work, even in a dry condition. Just hit the ball along the ground, make it as messy as possible. A messy, uh, uh, sorry, a messy entry inside forward fifty is potentially a better one than trying to get a mark that could be intercepted or spoiled or or whatever have you will. Yeah, I'm not sure what the statistic. I'm not sure off the top of my head how many marks were taken, but I, I'd imagine it would be a similar amount between the first quarter and then the other three quarters, given how yeah. wet it was. Didn't didn't see too many, like only one or two Max King marks really stuck. Yeah. Uh, stuck out to me. Um, I, I don't understand, Max, why players don't kick it along the ground, why they, why they try and get it clean. Like, there must be some reason why they don't because, you know, you could take a leaf out of Ronaldo or Messi's book and just <laughs> put it along the ground. But it, it would gain, like you said, Messi inside 50s, you know, you, you're better off gaining metres in a, in a wet game than try and be cute and, and get a mark inside 50. Yeah, no, I agree exactly. Um, and then you, you saw that Dan Butler, he was probably the only one in our forward line that really stepped up in the wet. And geez, does he look amazing over the last three or four weeks. He's put in a really good month of footy together. But just get it to to a point where the small forwards, all they have to do is a little toe poke or it's a little scoop up with their hands and and then they're, they're right in front of goal pretty much. Um, your big players, unless it is a big mark or you want, sorry, a big kick inside 50, you only really want them bringing it to ground. But I'd still rather have metres gained than, I guess, trying to take a mark inside the Ford 50 in the wet. But what do I know? I'm not the, uh, I'm no footy expert. Oh, I'd say you you might have a bit of a keen eye, maybe some more, more, more so than some of these analysts that we're seeing on on TV these days. Not to point fingers at anyone. Um, <laughs> what you, a lot's been spoken about about Max King's, um, you know, act of of shoving. I forget the name of the defend the Richmond guy. Um, Nick Mansell was Vlost- it? Was Vlostum? Vlostum. That's Vlost- it. Oh, whoever it was. Um, whoever no, it was. Happy- yeah. What do you What do you think of it? Yeah, I'm happy you brought this up. Um, I know Jake mentioned it, I believe, on Saints TV Weekly that he's not a whole a, bi- a big fan of it, and I think um, Joycey and Marshy, not speaking for them, but they they did sort of go into this on the podcast. Um, they're a bit, you know, more how do you do with it? Whereas I love seeing, you know, a big key forward get stuck right into um, the key ball, well, your, your direct opponent pretty much. If you want, if you take a, ple- a big clunk, let your defender know about it because I also love the fact that King was doing this in the first quarter. It's easy to, to talk smack when you're up and you're winning and everything's good and flying, but it's very hard to do that when the game's tied or the game's on a nice edge and still do it. Um Oh, sorry, there's just a comment that's come in. Big Noah Bolter, uh, Nick Bolter, Noah Bolter has played on um, Max King on the weekend. But Noah yeah, Bolter, I, I believe, yeah, yeah. Uh, I absolutely love it when a big key forward lets, lets their opposition know. And they, uh, some people call it arrogant, but I love when they, they get it right into them because you see it all across the world in a whole, lot, whole multitude of sports, but not really in the AFL players talking a lot of smack, but. Yeah, no, I'm a big fan of it. Yeah, and I believe if you go back to the late episodes of 2022, you will hear Joycey and Marshy explicitly talking about how King's getting quote-unquote manhandled in the goal square, particularly in the Brisbane game, um, and they wanted to see him give a little bit more to the defenders. So, you know, interesting that they're saying that now, but if yeah, if whoever's, whoever's got some time on their hands, if they'd like to go back to the round probably between rounds 20 and rounds 23 of last year from the, from the old Saints TV episodes and go find Joycey saying that, I'd be appreciative. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting <laughs> that Joycey thinks that now. Um, not to call him out. I still love you, Joycey, of course. Um, yeah, but that's enough about the Tigers. Maybe we talk a little bit about the Lions and the upcoming game. Yep, let's Spuds game. So, 
look, Jordan, I think you and I both commented on it when we uh, when we sat for a halftime drink at um, at the G. There was not nearly enough Saints fans there for the uh, the entire Richmond mob that, I don't know, I think it was 62,000 there at the G. So plenty of people, not a lot of Sainers. Um, mm. What's the excuse this week for Friday night footy? Uh, what's what's the weather like? I'm sure, you know, it could rain a little bit at Marvel Stadium. You never know. We could get a little <laughs> bit wet in there. Um, but saying as, you know, we, we, we always talk about prime time and, you know, wanting prime time games, but we never show up. So, you know, I'm not going to rant like I did a couple of weeks ago, but please show up. You know, it's, it's really disappointing when we don't get the fans there. Richmond, you can understand, you know, there's, there's a few viable excuses. You know, the the Frankston and the Cranbourne and Link Packenham lines were down, um, I believe, on, on Saturday night. And obviously that's really disappointing and the weather was was, to be fair, quite horrendous. And at the MCG, there's not many seats under cover. Um, but Marvel, you, you've really got no excuse not to be there. It's it's pretty accessible by public transport. If the Sandringham line is working, you've, you've got that option. You've also got trams. Um, can also uh, better parking than the MCG as well. So no excuses in that regard. Weather's fine. You're not going to get rained on. Um, please come to the game. Um <laughs> Yeah, but other than that, Brisbane should be a good game. Um, you know, I'm having flashbacks to last year when we played them at Marvel. We really should have won that game. You know, poor kicking, poor accuracy for goal let us down, and and Cam Rayner ended up running over the top of us. So who's who's the big biggest threat you see, Max, as part of Rich, uh, not Richmond, Brisbane? Sorry, who's the biggest threat to our side? I don't think it's one singular player, but I think the their forward line is the biggest threat. They've got obviously two big tools in. Hipwood and Danaher. Um, I don't think Hipwood's. Oh, sorry, I, I. So I don't think Hipwood's as big of a threat as you know the media may may love him to be. But um, hopefully that's not putting words you know directly feeding the uh, the Brisbane's attack on Friday night. But I think Danaher, uh, Hipwood, and then the Smalls, um, oh, Charlie Cameron. Sorry, that's his name. Well, had a bit, bit of a mental blank there. And then Cam Rayner as well. We, we saw Cam Rayner kick four goals on us and looked like an All Australian player last year. So I think them them four together uh, are probably the, the the most dangerous on the on the field come Friday night. Yep, I, I tend to agree. Charlie Cameron doesn't. I was going to say doesn't have too many bad games and was particularly quiet last week. Uh... Who they play? They played Sydney and and against Hawthorne. It was also quite quiet, so doesn't have too many bad games. This kid and is, is due for a big one against us. Um, I love watching him play, but maybe not when he's playing against us. So I hope he has another quiet one. Um, maybe he can you know turn it up the following week. Whoever they, I think they're playing Richmond the following week. So maybe he can turn it up against them. Um, you know, Charlie, if you're watching this, don't kick too many goals against us. Um, but the yes. other one, the other one I've got my eye on is Harris Andrews, who I thought had a a decent two games against us. We played Brisbane twice last year. Thought he played all right. Um, will be interesting to see. I think he he will be sent to Max King as Brisbane's tallest defender. Brisbane aren't a side that likes defending. They're not a side that particularly is good at defending. It's just something they, you know, mentally think they have to do, and they they just get on with it. So it'd be interesting to see how much effort um, Harris Andrews and Co put into. How much they get stuck into Max King like they did last time? You know they were pushing him all over the place, and whether Kingy gives some back to them, I think it'll be interesting to see the aerial battle between um, Old Harris Andrews and, and Max King. Yeah, I think uh, Jordan Harris Andrews might not even be playing on Max King come oh, Friday night. I've... Believe he's had a bit of a role change this year. He's still playing as a key position back, but he's now taking more intercept more of an intercepting role, um, very similar to a Jake Lever-esque Wilkie type role, um, maybe even Tom Stewart. But Did Brisbane have enough tall defenders to cover Max King, though? He'd be the tallest tallest bunch of them. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know for a while they were, they were running our you know, ex-St. Kilda player, Darren Joyce, but he got dropped after the first eight rounds maybe or so. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I believe, though, they, they want Harris Andrews playing as much as an intercepting defender, as opposed to just a key forward, but sorry, a key back. But who knows? They might they might pull the plug and say Max King's too tall, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what what they do on Friday night. Yeah, I'm thinking that's what might happen. I don't think Brisbane. I'm going through the list now and and just looking at the the height. Apart from Oscar McInerney, I mean, you've got Darcy Fort who could who could potentially match up in him. But apart from 
Um, Eric Hipwood and Joe Danaher play up forward. Harris Andrews is by far the tallest player. So I'm thinking they might not have much of a choice if they don't want to get Max off the leash. Um, Max King, that is, maybe not our Max. Um, <laughs> you know, they might have to send, um, you know, big Harris Andrews to him, and I wouldn't be surprised. It'd be interesting to see at the game on the weekend whether they send Harris Andrews to Max. We might have to, to put some money on that between us, Max, um, <laughs> if they will or not. But we yep. might just wrap it up there, Sainers. But as we always do, um, let's go into some score predictions. Yep, score predictions. Um, I reckon it's going to be a tight one. Friday night, under the roof at Marvel, um, for Spud. And, yeah, I think I think Ross Lyon, this is why we've got him into the club. He hasn't lost two games in a row this year. And I think that, that his preparation going in week to week is is so far been pretty spot on. I don't think there's maybe with the exception of, of the, the, what is it? The wet on Friday, uh, sorry, Saturday night that you might go, Oh, there was maybe a few questionable decisions there. But, but other than that, I think he's been absolutely perfect in his preparation following a loss. And it, it's resulted in not having two losses back to back. So I reckon Saints win. Uh, let's go 90 to 86 Saints win by four points. We win it in the last quarter. Yep, I'm going to say something similar. Uh, last year, it was St Kilda 9-12-66 to Brisbane 12-9-81. Uh, oh, a bit of a reverse there. Goals and behinds. Um, so I'm going to say the same thing except in reverse this time. So I reckon the Saints will get up by 15 points. Um, just going through a couple of the comments, Mr DJ Rootboy reckons the Saints will get up by a point. Uh, Chris reckons the Saints will win by 19 Beth reckons a 10-point win. Um, and we, we actually didn't talk about the Brisbane midfield. She's made some good points here about Dunkley and, and Lockie Neal. Lockie Neal yeah. in Brownlow form, maybe not as good as his 2020 form, but still a, a fantastic player. And Brisbane's midfield is one that, you know, is is not to be taken lightly. So it'll be interesting to see how we match up with them. Do you think Windy, do you think Windy goes to, to Neal like he did last time? I think, I'm not sure if, I can't, I've been asking a few Saints fans. I can't get a clear answer on whether it was Windy or Steele on Tim Taranto on Saturday night. Obviously, whoever it was let Tim Taranto get off the leash because he had 36 disposals and a terrific game. If it was Windhager, do we back him in to, to tag Lockie Neal? Yeah, I, I think Windhager goes on to tag Lockie Neal, but I don't think anyone actually tagged Taranto um, on f- Saturday night. Sorry, I don't. Um, I mean, I might be completely wrong, but at the ground, it didn't feel like anyone was being tagged. It felt very free flowing. We did have one player behind the uh, behind the ball when the, the wet hit, but that was just what the commentators were saying on um, on the or on the broadcast, I guess. But yeah, Sorry, I I mean, yeah, maybe I didn't mean tag. But who was who was um, Taranto's direct opponent? Do you know? Oh no, I couldn't tell you. Okay, well, hopefully, maybe, you know, not sure whether it was Steele or Windhager, but, yeah, hopefully we back Marcus in to, um, to you know, do what he did last year against Lockie Neal and hopefully he puts those second-year blues up behind him because we know he's a terrific player and he's he's capable of more than what he's showing now. Um, sorry, Steve, Jordan. Oh, sorry. Chris has just said Windy tagged Neal out of the game last year, I believe. That was directly after Windy tagged Tim Kelly out of the game where he kept him to only four to five touches, something like that. And then the week after we played Brisbane, uh, am I getting my dates right in that? Um, so I know we played, uh, was it round 20? No, the it f- was working backwards. So we played Sydney around 23, Brisbane around 22, Geelong around 21, Hawthorne around 20, West Coast in round 19. So it was, uh, Three weeks after he tagged Tim Kelly, but still in a short short time frame. Yes, yeah, just sorry, I pulled up the uh, the thingo, the fixture from last year. Round nineteen, you're right, was West Coast, and round twenty two was Brisbane. Geez, your memory serves you right, Jordan. Uh, I might know a thing or two about the Sainers because you know that might be my whole personality. Um. You know, uh, yeah, but, but he did do an exceptional job on both Tim Kelly and Lockie Neal last year. So hopefully if he does go to Neal on Friday night, it be interesting to see if he does, but hopefully he can back up what he did last year. Um, Max, one word for how you're feeling. Have you got Beth's word wheel up yet? Hold on, hold on. You go first. I'm, I'm here, just don't have the wheel up. 
Sorry, give me a sec. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go a boring one. I know, but I'm gonna go with anxious. I'm a little bit nervous following the game on the weekend. Um, you know the performance that we had. It, it whether or not we read a whole lot into it, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. But yeah, you never like coming off a loss. We have gone win loss win loss win loss recently, so maybe that does guarantee us a win. Um, but yeah, just remember how you know the the disappointment after facing Brisbane last year who canned our finals chances and it's you know a, a similar feeling almost just like spider mentioned you know we, we do every game matters now it's so close yeah between the the fourth uh, the, between the Brisbane Lions and whoever you know 12th and 13th are there's not many games sorry not many wins between them um on the ladder so every game does matter from here it's a finals like game so you know finals are on the line somewhat in this game. Uh, or at least top four, that is. So, yeah, pretty, pretty nervous for this one. I'm going to say anxious. Max, have you got your word? Yep. Word wheel is up. I don't know if everyone out on can see that. It's that top one there, important. Hopefully that's the right way and not in reverse for everyone. But my word is important. It's an important game, not only for the Saints footy club, but for men's mental health specifically um, and mental health as a whole. Um, we, we typically do do poor in, um, in Friday night games or in spotlight games. So, uh, yeah, I think it's an important one just to show how much um, this game means to the club and then just how much uh, we, we're really serious about playing finals as well. As, as Spider said before, if we, if we want to get some momentum going into September, we need to start now beating a team like Brisbane and then get, get a bit of momentum off the back of that, try and string a few wins together. Yep, just going through some of the, the comments. Beth sounds like we are haunted by our history. Maybe so. I'm still, you know, got the memories of Brisbane in my, firmly in my mind. Uh, Beth also says apprehensive. Guys disturbed. Um, <laughs> and Steve's just mentioning the win-loss pattern I mentioned earlier. I hope we win, but the win-loss pattern worries me. We'll play the Eagles the week after. I'll actually be at that game, and if we lose while we're in Perth, I will be absolutely devastated if we lose against the Waffle Eagles. So hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, but, yeah, Max, who's the player that you think will have a big game against the Brisbane Lions? Ooh. So I believe the boys on the podcast, they tipped Dougal Howard to have a big return game. Um, look, it just wasn't his night on Saturday night, and that's all well and good. So long as he comes back and is that Dougal Howard from 2020 that we all remember and we all loved. Um, but to be different, I'm not going to say him. The unfiltered fisherman reckons Kingy's going to have a big game. I reckon that's a pretty spot-on answer. Um, Beth reckons Wilkie. Sorry, I'm going to just keep delaying my answer. So, <laughs> to think of one. No, no, I've got one. Um, I reckon Mahogany would. He pops up out of nowhere, just sort of rekindles that AA form from the first six, seven rounds. Um, not that he's been down on form at all, but just he was so electrifying, averaging 20 in a goal a game those first six rounds or seven rounds. So I reckon he comes back, does what he did last year to Brisbane and, and kicks four goals or so or three goals and just absolutely racks up the pill on the wing. Yep, for me, I'm going to say Jimmy Webster, a bit out of left field. Um, but he was the one who was tasked with Charlie Cameron, both, I think in both games last year, and did a pretty good job on him. Um, Webster's been maybe a little bit out of form, had that horrific injury in round three in our 150th game, which we managed to win against the Bombers. Um, so had a bit of bad luck with injury, but has been you know maybe a bit off defensively, and this is a good chance for him to to find himself in some good form. Um, you know, being tasked with going up against someone like Charlie Cameron is no easy task. So um, you know, if he's able to to take that scalp, that that would be, you know, really good for Webster and a good confidence booster. Yep, exactly right. Chris reckons Brad Crouch or Rowan Marshall. Guy reckons Marshall. Um, and if that's the last sort of comment, I reckon we wrap it up from there. Three, two, one. Yep, no one else has commented, so we'll wrap it up there, saying as um, – Big day tomorrow, uh, 10.30 at RCA Park. Get down there. Uh, Jordan and I will be there. Hopefully the Godfather himself. Maybe maybe Joycey and, and Marshy as well, but we don't know about them too. They're, they're a bit of a TBD, I believe. Um, so, yeah, if you see us down there, 
feel free to say hi, feel free to come grab a photo or just chat Saints footy. That, that'd be awesome for us. It means Jordan and I get, you know, get don't have to be stuck talking to each other the entire day. Am I right, Jordan? Yep, that's right, because, you know, as much as we do love each other, we, we do maybe get a bit, a bit sick of each other at times. Oh, I'm just kidding. Um, just a reminder to check out the podcast and Jake's other weekly video if you haven't already. And as always, thank you guys for watching. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday night and have a great week. Go the Saners. See you guys next time. Stay up.